the absolute worst thing that a person can feel is hopelessness. Hope is what drives us forward, step by step and day by day. But in Mandela County, Wisconsin, an emergent threat proves that there's something much, much worse than hopelessness. Indeed, in this small rural patch of the Midwest, hope itself has been weaponized against mankind. If you're unfamiliar with the Mandela Catalog, well, I would guess that you've been living under a rock. That, that or the YouTube algorithm just didn't show it to you or something, I don't know. In any case, it's no exaggeration to say that the series, created by Alex Kister, is one of the most well-loved horror projects on YouTube today. With over 30 million views on Alex's main channel, calling the series a hit is quite the understatement. We've gotten to see Alex develop as a creator since the series began, sharpening his skills and adding a few new tools to his kit along the way. The series is a masterclass in the use of uncanny sound and visuals. The narrative gives the sense that we're only getting a small glimpse of a story that's unfolding on a cosmic scale. But those are just the basics. What really makes this series so frightening? I believe it has to do with the unique way that the series treats one key emotion, hope. Typically, hope is not the emotion that comes to mind when you think of a horror movie. When Laurie Strode is desperately trying to run from old Mike Myers, what emotions is she feeling? Well, based on her face, you might say something along the lines of fear, panic, or terror. While that's definitely true, what I want you to consider is this. Why is she running in the first place? When we ask that question, we get a pretty different answer. She isn't running because she's afraid or because she's panicking. She's not even running because there's a killer chasing her. Lori's running because she hopes that she can get away. I mean, if she had absolutely no hope of escape, she wouldn't even try to fight. Deep down, there's the hope that she can escape her pursuer. And of course, this isn't just the case in Halloween, or even in horror. In every movie where a character fights to survive, they're ultimately fighting on behalf of the hope that they might win, no matter the odds. Don't misunderstand, I'm not talking about the sort of hope that makes you feel warm and fuzzy. I'm talking about inconvenient, reluctant hope that forces you to do difficult things because you cannot shake the instinct to fight. It's a hope that often brings pain, but also, very rarely, brings victory. In the Mandela Catalog, this concept plays out in a way you've never seen before. Really quickly, if you haven't watched the full series yet, I am going to be spoiling some of the biggest twists and turns all the way up through Volume 4. So, I do encourage you to watch it for yourself first. Now, let's jump into the analysis. I'm going to be looking at the theme of hope through the eyes of four characters. Mark Heathcliff, who misplaced his hope and died because of it. Jonah Marshall, who had hope, even in the enemy. Adam Murray, whose hope brought him to the tree of good and evil. And finally, Thatcher Davis, whose hope is dimmed, but never died. Mark Heathcliff's history with alternates began at a young age when he survived an encounter with the man in the corner. The very same man in the corner would later turn out to be the alternate known as the intruder, an evil being that kidnaps children to drive their parents into the depths of despair. Now, it's difficult to live a normal life after coming face to face with an alternate, especially at such a young age, but Mark tried his best. He made friends with people like Caesar Torres, went to church, and tried to let go of what he had seen. However, the alternate's plans for him were not so peaceful. After many years of carrying the weight of his childhood, Mark's friend Caesar called him up one night with a dire request. The dangers of living in a world of monsters is that you never know when one of those monsters is wearing your best friend's face or speaking in his voice. Mark decides to oblige his friend, and the trap is sprung. Something follows him home from Caesar's house, an alternate. Once Mark catches on to the fact that something is pursuing him, he arms himself with a handgun and locks himself in his room, hoping that somebody will come to rescue him. Unfortunately, the police have been given a single directive. Ignore all calls that may be related to an alternate encounter. Try as he might to survive, Mark was doomed the moment he locked himself inside. For three days, Mark prays for help as the alternate taunts him through the door. Finally, the alternate sets the horrendous burden of forbidden knowledge upon Mark's shoulders. It convinces him that long ago, a being of unimaginable malice usurped control of this world from its creator. 
For three days, Mark has been praying for peace and comfort. Who have I been praying to all this time? Mark scratches these words into a notebook over and over and over and over again until the words bleed into one another and morph into an illegible black mass of ink. Finally, he succumbs to the psychological torture of the alternate and turns his weapon upon himself. As a Christian and a philosopher, this reveal chills me in a way that few other horror stories could. Mark thought he had something to put his hope in, but in the end, his hope turned false and served only to drive him deeper into the hopelessness. If an alternate has complete control over reality, that leads to a terrifying conclusion about the world of the Mandela Catalog. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, a German philosopher, put forth the idea that we live in the best of all possible worlds. Essentially, he argued that a maximally good God would create a world with the least possible suffering and the greatest possible good. That means for humans to have free will must be so good that it outweighs any suffering we may face as a result. If the Creator's been overthrown by a creature of pure evil, I think we can rationally conclude that the people of Mandela County live in the worst of all possible worlds. That means every good is only allowed to occur because it leads to greater tragedy and greater suffering. Hope is permitted only because it leads to greater hopelessness, joy to greater joylessness, and understanding gives way only to supreme madness, which inevitably leads us to ask, in such a world, is it better not to hope at all? Jonah Marshall is the first character we see to challenge this question by clinging to hope in the face of despair. Jonah is a member of an organization known as the Bythorn Paranormal Society, or BPS for short, a group of individuals from a neighboring county who attempt to fight back against the alternate threat. The BPS is almost entirely unprepared to deal with the situation, but still, they hold their ground as best they can against an indomitable force. Jonah teams up with another member of the society named Adam, an outcast even among outcasts. Jonah treats Adam as a true friend and chooses to see the best in him, even if the compassion is rarely reciprocated. Jonah brings a levity to the series that we don't really see anywhere else. He's constantly picking fun at Adam, cracking jokes, and generally trying to stay above the situation with the alternates. It's really refreshing to see some humor in a series about horrific monsters attempting to convince humanity to self-eliminate. He brings color and life to an otherwise dreary world. This is, however, a horror series, and you know that such a bright soul can't stick around forever. When Adam and Jonah receive a tip about an alternate, they set out to investigate. For Jonah, it's a road trip with a friend. For Adam, it's nothing more than a nuisance. When they arrive, Adam ventures into the home alone, unaware that it's the home of Cesar Torres, the very same house that Mark visited three days before his death. Soon. Adam starts acting strangely, and Jonah pleads with him to leave. When it becomes clear that isn't going to happen, Jonah decides that his best option, his only hope, is to leave his friend behind. Fear courses through his body as he slams his foot down and races towards safety. Static buzzes, and the wretched, twisted voice of the intruder emanates from the car's analog radio. You left him behind, it says. Jonah presses his foot against the gas pedal, speeding up. What will he do? The alternate continues. Jonah screams at the radio. Open your eyes, it repeats, driving Jonah into a panic. He pulls the car over to the side of the road and exits the vehicle, desperate for some escape from the accusing voice. With Jonah's hope unshattered, the alternate resorts to direct violence. Jonah Marshall, one small light immersed in endless darkness, is snuffed out on an insignificant roadside in the middle of Wisconsin. Jonah's death hit me harder than any other characters. At one point, he asks Adam to come back to the car to get a pizza and go home, and that just hurt my soul. Jonah tries so hard to just be bros with Adam to justify hoping in him, and in the end, it costs him his life. In Mandela County, light shines only to prove how dark it really is. Still, I'd like to imagine a world where Adam agrees, comes back to the car, and 
things turn out okay. The alternates, however, have very different plans for Adam Murray. Really quick, I just want to say that I've been totally blown away by your guys' support for the last video. I let you guys know that we were almost at 100 subscribers, and here we are a week later with over 300. That's unbelievable. If you're watching and you aren't subscribed, just know that you're welcome here and we'd love to have you as part of our community. Now, back to the video. A baby boy sat alone in a room, and yet he was not quite alone. His imaginary friend kept him company. The boy looked up at his friend, its face like Play-Doh after every color had been smashed together and perhaps a little bit had been eaten. The awful visage made him scream. For hours and hours he screamed. Even at that age, young Adam Murray knew that it was wrong, evil. Mommy doesn't look like that. Daddy doesn't look like that. Do I look like that? If I look in the mirror, what would I see? Adam crawled into the dark basement of Caesar's house. Now, after all these years, he would finally get what he hoped for. Answers. The alternates would lead him to his mother. In the basement, the imaginary friend of his childhood stares back at him from the screen of a tube TV, but he doesn't recognize it. He calls out to the face, and a response comes through the speakers. Don't you remember me? At every turn, Adam's motivation in the series has been opposite to every other character. He haphazardly pursues information from the alternates, even at risk to his own body and mind, and he alone escapes unharmed and unfazed. Here, at the foot of the tree of good and evil, Adam commits to the pursuit of forbidden knowledge. An ancient evil whispers in his ear, and Adam agrees to take those whispers as the gospel truth, which will definitely turn out great for everyone. The answers that Adam finds have little to do with his mother, but instead reveal an uncomfortable truth about himself. Do you remember that night, Murray? When you stare into the mirror, you see the same monsters from your bedroom, don't you? Your skin is not your own. You're not the real you. Adam Murray, the real Adam Murray, has likely been dead for nearly 17 years, replaced by the most convincing alternate in existence. That's why he alone is able to have his hopes fulfilled. He finds answers because it's the worst possible thing that could happen to him. The discovery of his true nature was the worst hell that could befall the alternate who lived as a man. Hope to hopelessness, joy to joylessness, understanding to madness. In the middle of this darkness, one last light shines that has not been snuffed out. The flame that lies at the deepest reaches of the void, yet flickers on steadily. Thatcher Davis the last police officer in Mandela County has a more tumultuous relationship with Hope than any other character in the series. He lives in the basement of the abandoned police station, where he is constantly surrounded by alternates that taunt him but refuse to kill him. Thatcher finds himself at the middle of an alternate assault, one that seeks to destroy his mind as they did with Mark and so many others before him. There's only one issue. It's not working. Inconceivably, Thatcher holds out in the face of madness and chooses to continue living. Thatcher has hope not only of saving his own life, but also that Mandela County might one day be free of the alternates. His hope extends, albeit dimmed and trampled, to humanity itself. Despite suffering the worst torture that the alternates have enacted upon anyone, he hangs on to the one in a trillion chance that humankind might have a way out from under the thumb of evil. It's the joyless, torturous hope that forces you to stay in the game because there might be a chance of winning. But it does keep Thatcher in the game. Even as he is mocked by a creature wearing his own face, Thatcher proves that the alternates are not omnipotent. As the story of the Mandela catalog progresses, 
we'll start to see the role that Thatcher Davis will play. One day, Thatcher will look into the eyes of pure evil, perhaps even his own eyes, and speak out to it. There's not enough room for the two of us. I'm Curmudgeon. Thanks for watching.